Well, dear friends, today we do indeed continue our series of messages uh, entitled Summer Psalms of Comfort. And in light of our sharing time and we hear what many of us are going through uh, in the way of adversity or heartache, uh, it seemed to be a, a, a series that the Lord laid on my heart in a very timely fashion. In fact, some of you have assured me of that, that these are timely messages for you personally, for your family, in light of some of the things you are going through. And so today we turn to Psalm 84. Psalm 84, again, in the Old Testament, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Psalm 84. If you are using a maroon Bible, this can be found on page 508, page 508 in our maroon Bibles. You can see in the subscription there for the director of music, according to Gedith, we don't really know what that term means. It seems to be some kind of a musical term of the sons of Korah, a psalm. Now, I just want to highlight for you, depending on what version you have, this version of the NIV unfortunately drops the word Selah, where it is in the original manuscripts, in two places. You may find it in your Bible, again, depending on your translation. Selah is found in the original after verse 4 and again after verse 8. Biblical scholars really don't know what that term Selah means. The root of it, the S-L-H in transliterated English uh, vocabulary, would convey the meaning of a verb which means to lift up. And so Bible scholars believe that when you see a Selah, it perhaps was a musical interlude, interlude where the psalmist raised his harp or somebody played something musically uh, as a pause for people to stop and meditate and think specifically on what had just been read or sung. That's probably the essence of the meaning. But again, unfortunately, the NIV drops that term Selah, but I draw your attention to the fact that it is there after verse 4 and again after verse 8. But beginning in verse 1 of Psalm 84, let us hear then the word of the Lord. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty! My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Selah. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Selah. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. And as always, dear friends, I ask and urge you to keep your Bibles open and handy. In fact, I draw your special attention in Psalm 84 to verses 5 through 7, as verses 5 through 7 will constitute our text for today. And Brother Lucian, I just give you a heads up. I think Justin had to go out. Just make sure he doesn't get locked out. I, he might have taken one of the kids to the car or something. Just don't want him to be stuck out there, you might say. Psalm 84, verses 5 through 7, again, are our text. Well, dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, does the name J.C. Philpot mean anything to you? The name J.C. Philpot. For many of us, it probably doesn't mean a whole lot. And indeed, it meant absolutely nothing to me until several years ago, one of the young people at the Pompton Plains Reformed Bible Church, where I was ministering for several years, gave me this volume by J.C. Philpott. 
It is called through Baca's veil. Through Baca's veil. J.C. Philpot, his church historians tell us, seceded from the Church of England in the year 1835, sacrificing his reputation and career for conscience sake. It also says that he became the strict Baptist pastor at Stamford and Oakham and editor of the Gospel Standard magazine for many years. Well, friends, this volume that I have that that young person very kindly gave me through Baca's veil, you may have noticed the title comes from verse 6 of our scripture reading for today in Psalm 84. Here in verse 6 of Psalm 84, we read, as they pass through the valley of Baca. Now, many Bible commentators, along with J.C. Philpott, we've got John Calvin, we've got Matthew Henry, and many other biblical luminaries, translate that phrase, which reads in our text, the Valley of Baca, as the Valley of Weeping. Or, Mike, why don't you just, yeah, we'll just let it do its thing. Okay, yeah, that's, that's better, thank you. Yeah, it gets a little strobloody otherwise. The Valley of Weeping, it should be translated, or the Valley of Tears. And friends, notice that the great Reformation uh, leader, Martin Luther, indicates that the location of the Valley of Baca is unknown. Uh, Archaeologists, biblical historians, Bible scholars have never been able to pinpoint where the so-called Valley of Baca was or is located. And so most Bible commentators, again, believe that it sort of should be understood in the sense of Psalm 23, verse 4, where the psalmist David speaks of the valley of the shadow of death, you see. With the valley of Baca, or the valley of weeping, or the valley of tears, being symbolic of the danger, or the difficulties, or the struggles, or the sorrows, or the trials, or the tribulations of life, which the Israelites had to go through, as they were making pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem and coming into God's holy presence. The valley of weeping, the valley of tears, the valley of Baca. But friends, I ask you this question. Is it not true that we are Christian pilgrims passing through this life on our way not to a physical Jerusalem, but to the spiritual Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the holy city, our eternal home in heaven. And is it not true that just as was true physically for those Israelites some 3,000 years ago, so too you and I are passing through our own valley of weeping, valley of tears, valley of Baca, with all of the dangers and the difficulties and the sorrows and the struggles and the sufferings and the trials and the tribulations which you and I either have faced are facing in our life today or surely will face before the number of our days on earth is complete. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Well, friends, interestingly enough, as we work our way through the words of our text in Psalm 84, verses 5 through 7, we find that just as the sacred psalmist says that blessed are those who dwell in the house of the Lord, so too he goes on to say that blessed are all those who long to appear in the presence of the Lord. And the reason he says that is because whether they were physically traveling to Jerusalem in Old Testament times, or whether you and I are spiritually traveling to the New Jerusalem in New Testament times, the promise of the gospel is that each and every one of our needs will surely be met. And they will be met by the God who is sovereign of all things, He is the God who has numbered each and every one of our days before they comes to be. be, And He has promised never to leave us or fail us or forsake us, even and especially at those times when you and I may be passing through the valley of Baca. Even and especially at those times when you and I may be passing through the valley of Baca. Now, friends, as we begin to work our way through verses 5 through 7 of our text in Psalm 84, we're going to notice that as Christian pilgrims, in order for us to make it safely and successfully through the Valley of Baca, there are three key, critical, personal, practical self-examinations in which we must engage. There are three key personal, 
practical self-examinations in which we must engage if we desire to go successfully through the Valley of Baca. The first self-examination our text teaches us in which we must engage is that we must examine our hearts. We must examine our hearts. For example, look at verse 5 of our text in Psalm 84 with me, if you would please. The psalmist says, Blessed. It is a Hebrew term which the reformer John Calvin translates as happy, happy. The Reformation Study Bible makes a note and says it is a Hebrew term which means to enjoy God's special favor and grace. To enjoy God's special favor and grace. Blessed are those, notice, whose strength is not in themselves, is not in their own ability, not in their own position or power or pension or assets or, or anything. It says, blessed are those whose strength, notice, is in you, is in you. Begs the question, is in who? Well, go back to verse 1 when he says, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. That's uh, in the Hebrew, it's Yahweh Sabaoth. Some of your translations say the Lord God of hosts, a phrase which Calvin translates as the God of armies. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Yahweh Sabaoth, the God of armies. Now, friends, if you would care to turn with me, if you want to just listen, that's okay. But that same principle is very powerfully presented by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you want to go to the New Testament with me, if you want to just listen, that's fine. But otherwise, on page 999 in our Maroon Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, drop down with me, please, to verses 7 through 10. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, page 1099, the Apostle Paul declares, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The Apostle Paul sets forth that same teaching much more succinctly in Philippians 4 verse 13 when he says, I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. Now, friends, keep those biblical texts in mind as we bring them to bear back on the words of our text in Psalm 84, verse 5. Look with me again, please. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Now, stay with me. A little more literally from the Hebrew, that last phrase, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage, could, perhaps should be translated, in whose hearts are the highways in whose hearts are the highways. What does that mean? Biblical scholars say it refers to the highways the Israelites took to observe the religious festivals at Jerusalem or at Zion, as it is referenced in verse 7. But again, look with me, please. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Bible scholars say that that term in the original, that word for hearts, uh, refers to the center of the human spirit from which spring emotions, thought, motivation, courage, and action. Proverbs 4.23 says that the heart is the wellspring of life, the wellspring of life. But what does that mean? Blessed are those whose hearts are set in, on pilgrimage. It means blessed are those who desire nothing more than being in the very presence of God in order to worship God. It refers to those being blessed who desire nothing more from the very innermost recesses of their being than to go and be in the presence of God and to worship God. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Question, does that describe you? Does it describe you? Does it describe you? Does it describe me? My heart is set on pilgrimage. There is nothing more that I desire than to go to be in the presence of God 
in order to meet with God and to worship God. Does that describe us? It described the psalmist. Did you notice that? It described the psalmist right through the whole psalm. In fact, look at verses 1 and 2. He says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Verse 10, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Think of that. Think of what his testimony was. You know, I love it. There's an old gospel song. The sacred songwriter put it this way. I learned it, boys and girls, actually in the days of my youth. And it's amazing. The things you learn when you're young stay with you as you, as you get older. They say it gets harder to memorize things as you get older. I think that's probably true. But if you young people, children, if you memorize things while you're young, It'll stay with you the rest of your life. I was in, I don't know if I shared this with you before, I was in a seventh grade uh, uh, science class at Eastern Christian uh, Middle School. It was, it was called junior high school back in the day in North Jersey in uh, Prospect Park. And we had a science teacher, really stern, but a really godly woman. And she would always um, start out the science class by reading scripture and then making us memorize one of those verses. We could pick whatever verse we wanted of what she read. We had to memorize it. And I can remember one, one kid in the class back in seventh grade, he raised his, her name was Mrs. Lucas, it just came to me. He raised his hand and he said, Mrs. Lucas, this is science class. Why do we have to memorize scripture? I will never forget what she said. And so we have a lot of teachers here. Listen to what she said. Stuck with me all these years. She said, I'm quoting her. We have to memorize scripture. And she said, you need to memorize scripture. Because someday, your eyes are going to be so filled with tears, you're not going to be able to read it. That's what you think of that. We need to memorize scripture. Because someday, your eyes are going to be so full of tears, you're not going to be able to read it. It's true. It's true. So the songwriter says, there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God. There is a place of comfort sweet, near to the heart of God. A place where we are Savior meet, near to the heart of God. There is a place of full release, near to the heart of God. A place where all is joy and peace, near to the heart of God. O oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, Sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before thee near to the heart of God. Friends, if you and I desire to be found successfully and safely passing through the valley of Baca, and first of all, the Bible says we must examine our hearts. We must examine our hearts. Now, friends, I'm going to pause again. This has been a very strange day with the lights and everything. Do I hear something coming over the speakers? Okay, Becky. I think when you took the little radio out to test this, it's still on. No, that was from the kitchen. In the that was from the, okay. Uh, all right, if you, go, okay, if you go back there, find the copier. There's a radio by the copier, might, might be on. Maybe it was off with the power and then it came back on. And just flip it off and we'll see if that turns it off. Because sometimes we come in here on the Sunday morning and there's, it's on. And if you kill that, let me just give a second. Kyle, you can bear with this. <laughs> all right. Let me go help her find it. Don't, please don't leave. Okay. All right. See, I hear it coming over the PA. It's over here. It's right here. Oh, look at that. Got it. Did that work? All right. Thanks, Becky. Okay. Do you want me to start over? <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. We, we go back to the text. Is that, is that better? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what a day. Uh, we go back to our text. We find, secondly, the second self-examination in which we must be engaged if we desire to successfully be passing through the Valley of Baca is that we must examine our habits. We must examine our habits. Look at verse 6 with me, if you would please, of Psalm 84. Psalm 84. As they pass through the Valley of Baca. Now stay with me. That word proper, baka, can be translated in different ways. Scholars say if it's translated as a noun, 
it means balsam tree. It means balsam tree. If it's translated as a verb, it means weeping. It means weeping. Now, while it is true that there were many balsam trees scattered throughout the arid desert through which the Israelites were passing when they would do their pilgrim journeys for the feasts and festivals in Jerusalem, I side with Luther and Calvin and Matthew Henry and many others who believe that that particular term, given its context, ought to be translated more in the sense of weeping. And it should be called the Valley of Weeping or the Valley of Tears. Again, due to the incredible hardships with those, which those physical pilgrims and you and me as spiritual pilgrims must pass through during the course of our lives. In fact, there's another personal reason why I think that those luminaries, uh, theolog theological luminaries were correct in, in saying weeping and not balsam trees is because of what the rest of the text says. As they pass through the valley of Baca, and now we're thinking weeping, they make it a place of springs. You see, it isn't naturally a place of springs. They have to make it a place of springs. And that's why I think weeping is probably the better translation there. They make it a place of springs. They make it a place of refreshing. They make it a place of refreshing. As they wind their way to Jerusalem and as you and I wind our way to the holy city. In fact, Matthew Henry, the great Puritan preacher, puts it this way, commenting on that part of the text. Listen carefully, please. Matthew Henry says, Our way to heaven lies through a valley of Baca." a valley of weeping. But even that may be made a well if we properly apply the comforts God has provided for the pilgrims to the heavenly city. I'm going to read that again. Profound thought. Matthew Henry. Our way to heaven lies through a valley of Baca, a valley of weeping. But even that may be made a well if we properly apply the comforts God has provided for the pilgrims to the heavenly city. End of quote. Now, that begs the question, what might be some of those comforts which God has provided to you and me as earthly pilgrims winding our way spiritually to the holy city? What might some of those comforts be? Well, friends, I think we need to begin with what theologians refer to as the means of grace, the means of grace. That is worship, Bible reading, study, meditation, prayer, the celebration of the sacraments, means of grace means by which God strengthens us spiritually. And we can add to that simply the fellowship of God's people, the love that we are commanded by Christ to have for one another as members of His family. And then we can add to that the peace and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus promised to give His disciples. In fact, if you want to turn with me, if you want to just listen again, that's fine. But otherwise, go to the New Testament with me, please, to the Gospel according to John, chapter 14, verses 16 through 19. John, chapter 14, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 14, page 927 in the Maroon Bible, page 927. John, chapter 14, verses 16 through 19. Jesus is speaking shortly before He goes to the cross to pay the penalty for the sins of His people. And in John 14, verse 16, Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And by the way, isn't that a great Gaither song? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Okay, glorious, glorious song. Speaking of here, the Holy Spirit. Now, friends, if you're in John with me, flip back a page or two to the left to John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. John chapter 7, 37 through 39. We read on the last and greatest day of the festival or the feast. This was the feast of booths or tabernacles, which the um, Israelites celebrated. It was one of the great pilgrim feasts. The men had to go up to Jerusalem for the feast of booths or tabernacles. And it was commemorating their wilderness wanderings when they had to live in booths or tents uh, on their way to the promised land. So it says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. 
Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now, friends, keep your spiritual antenna up. It doesn't mean the Spirit had not been given unto salvation because it says it, was, it had not yet been given to those who believed in Him. But it was not yet given in the sense of Pentecost when it was poured out in power, enabling the uh, apostles to speak in other languages which they had not learned, etc. But let's go back now to the words of our text after looking at John. And we go back to our text in Psalm 84. And look with me again, please, at verse 6. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. We have a human responsibility to, to engage in drawing on the means of comfort and strength, spiritual sustenance, which God has so graciously given us. But then it says it's paired with His divine sovereignty. They make it a place of spring. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. Who's in charge of the rains, boys and girls? Who's in charge of whether it's a drought or a flood? God is in charge of that. And so you've got this, this divine sovereignty paired with our human responsibility. In fact, you don't have to turn to it. I'll just read it real quick. But in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul brings those two things together, our human responsibility and God's divine sovereignty. In Philippians 2, 12 and 13, he says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work at your salvation with fear and trembling. Human responsibility. Verse 13 goes on. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose, divine sovereignty. But friends, think about this phrase again. They make it a place of springs. They make it a place of springs. Has to do with our habits. Has to do with our habits. Boys and girls, a habit has been defined in Webster's Dictionary as a customary or characteristic practice. A customary or characteristic practice practice. Mainly, my young friends, it means something you regularly do, something you regularly do, something I regularly do. That's a habit. How would you or I define or describe our habits, our habits? What do we regularly or customarily do? As you're thinking about your habits, and I'm thinking about my habits, let me ask us this respectfully. Does it include availing ourselves of the means of grace? Does it include availing ourselves of fellowship opportunities among the family of God? Does it include personal, persistent, passionate prayer? Does it include weekly worship? Does it include daily Bible reading and meditating on that word? How would you define or describe your habits and how would I define or describe mine? Do our habits help make the Valley of Baca a place of springs? That's the question. That's the question. And friends, if our habits do not do that, if our habits do not help make the Valley of Baca a place of springs, guess what? Well, then the Valley of Baca is going to remain a very dry and arid and desert-like place for you and me. When we go through those times of weeping, it's going to be a very lonely, sad, despairing, depressing time for you and me. But the good news of the gospel is that to the extent that by the grace of God, you and I avail ourselves of those, what Henry called the comforts God provides, we will be able to make the valley of Baca a place of springs. And it will be paired with the autumn rains, which God covers with pools in the valley. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Divine sovereignty, but our human responsibility, they come together. As you and I examine our habits, as we examine our habits, because that is step number two for us to be able to be successfully and safely passing through the valley of Baca. Well, friends, there's one last, and I'm going to touch on this all too briefly today. There's one last way in which you and I must um, examine ourselves if we desire to safely pass through the valley of Baca. And that is that we must examine our hope. We must examine our hope. Boys and girls, again, Webster's Dictionary defines hope as... To desire with expectation of obtainment. To desire with expectation of obtainment. Or to desire something that you're pretty sure you're going to get. I like to define hope as faith looking forward. Faith looking forward. But in either case, they both convey a sense of having a core or center of something solid which guarantees that you'll be brought safely through. And so look at verse 7 of our text as it closes. Verse 7. It says, they. 
Who is they? Well, it's referring to those whose strength is in the Lord Almighty, verse 5. It's referring to those whose hearts are set on pilgrimage, desiring to be in the presence of God. It's, it's referring to those who, who pass through the valley of Baca and make it a place of springs, you see. That's who it's referring to. They go from strength to strength. Think of that. I heard, a, a, it, was a, it was two girls, actually. They, they were like gospel singers. They came to Pompton Plains one time. I, and they sang a song. They were called uh, the Servant's Handmaids or something. How do you remember? I think that was what they were called, so the Servant's Handmaids. And they sang, based on that part of the psalm, going from strength to strength. And at that point in my life, I had never really clung on to that phrase, going from strength to strength. Like, what does that mean? Well, think about it. We are, we are, we are spiritual pilgrims going through, and they were physical pilgrims, going through all kinds of physical and spiritual difficulties. The road is steep. The road is rough. The road is hard. But instead of growing weaker and weaker, they go from strength to strength. Like, how could that possibly be? And as I was prayerfully meditating, friends, on that part of the text this week, you know what verses came to my mind? And maybe they're coming to your mind, how, how that could be? It was Isaiah 40, page 622, if you want to turn. Isaiah 40, Oh, no, excuse me, it's page uh, 620, page 620 in the, in the Maroon Bible. Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. Isaiah 40, page 620, verses 28 through 31. I think this is the key. The prophet Isaiah says, beginning in uh, Isaiah 40, verse 28, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Think of it. I think that's the key for proper understanding of how anyone could go from strength to strength. They go from strength to strength. And the reason is because of where their hope is placed. It's because of the one to whom they are looking and the one for whom they are longing. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Their earthly Jerusalem, our heavenly Jerusalem, till each appears before God in Zion. It's a promise God gives his people. As Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. All glory be to God. All glory be to God. Friends, I'm going to close with uh, this illustration. Give me one second. The supposedly true story is told many years ago. There was a, a tugboat pulling a huge barge across one of the Great Lakes when it ran into a horrific storm. The barge, unfortunately, sank. And it was tending to bring the tugboat and all of the captain and crew down with it. So all night long, the, the captain and his crew are fighting feverishly to keep their boat alive amidst the wind and the waves and the, the threat of drowning. Just at daybreak, right as their boat was about to sink under the waves as well, they were spotted by a passing ship. And that ship steamed over to their location, rescued the captain and the crew before their boat went under the water, and they brought them safely to shore. On the shoreline, the captain of that tugboat was asked, what was it? How could it be? that they were able to carry on through that horrific storm and the danger and direness of their circumstances and make it safely through the night. And in answer to that question, the captain very calmly replied, and I'm quoting him now. He said, well, the reason is, is because off in the distance, through the darkness, along the shoreline, we could see the lights of home. We could see the lights of home. Think about that. 
My friend, by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, off in the distance, through the darkness, on heaven's shoreline, can you see the lights of home? Can you see the lights of home? My friend, if not, if you cannot, then I would ask and urge you, I would pray and I would respectfully plead with you to see to it that today and every day you take a personal examination of your heart, of your habits, and of your hope. Because to the extent that they are directly aligned with the will of God as revealed in the Word of God, my friend, I assure you that you and I will, in fact, journey safely and successfully through the valley of Baca. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together in prayer. O oh, our mighty God and most merciful Heavenly Father, Many years ago, John Newton so insightfully penned the words, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. O oh, Father, may such grace, through faith, be made manifest in each and every one of our hearts and minds and lives. O oh Lord, we pray, as each of us examines our hearts, our habits, and where we have placed our hope, to the end that we might all be found safely and successfully passing through the valley of Baca. Hear us, O oh faithful Father, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.